<laughs> I'm fascinated with the evolution of Dr. Michael Greger. His oldest talks that I've seen were on mad cow disease and pandemics. One should ask oneself, is it reasonable that if a consumer undercooks a hamburger, their three-year-old dies? Scientists at NYU trace the path of some of these superbugs, quote-unquote, starting, for example, with the mass feeding of the Cipro class of antibiotics to chickens. Those were vital topics, and he had a solid book. But I don't think pandemics were a hot topic before COVID, were they? I don't see how you could tell from those talks that he would become an international bestseller in nutrition and fill theaters for book signings. And there's actually a whole line of people outside of that theater, like super fans, going to a concert. <laughs> He's filling those theaters with a message that isn't exactly a path to internet stardom. Back off on the steak and butter and have another helping of greens. The road to fame and fortune for nutrition influencers is paved with beef, butter, and supplements. And that's to strike one against Dr. Greger. Strike two is he used to work for the Humane Society and has taken in many rescue animals. So critics can claim he's doing this for ideological reasons, and that's a bias. I know that claim well because as an earth scientist, I have many reasons for favoring plant-dominant diets, and health is just one. Deforestation has skyrocketed in the Amazon, and the main culprit is right behind me. Everyone in North Carolina knows that pig poop can be a big problem but there's not a lot of agreement about how to solve it. Today, almost all the meat we eat comes from farms like this. What worries scientists is that that also makes it an ideal environment for the pathogens that cause pandemics. Salmonella sickens and kills more of us than any other foodborne pathogen. The bacteria are fighting back and they're defeating the drug. Correct. So my comment section is filled with people who say caring about that stuff makes me biased. The implication is you should only get dietary advice from people who don't care about those things. My perspective is the more important thing to worry about is following the money. And strike three is Dr. Greger doesn't spend a lot of time lifting big weights to get ripped. Hey, I'm not dissing people who do. I admire Simon Hill, who, like Dr. Greger, eats only plants, has a great book, but loves to lift weights. So we decided to crash one of his signings with my camera in hand to find out why his fans are so passionate. I did not expect to discover that this guy... Creutzfeldt jakob disease, or CJD, is a human spongiform encephalopathy. ...turned into this guy when he gets on a stage in front of an audience. I'm going to be talking about Chuck E. Cheese for, and I'm not kidding about this, the next 25 minutes. <laughs> You can stop watching this at any time if you like, but this studio audience cannot leave. I mean, come on. John Oliver has great material to work with. Just search Chuck E. Cheese Fight on Google and you will unlock hours of content. Gregor's material is technical papers. <sighs> this decline is seen across the biological spectrum with one remarkable exception. Naked mole rats. <laughs> Also known by their more cuddly nickname, Sand Puppy. <laughs> Considered to be a non-aging mammal, thought to be because they maintain high levels of spermidine, something you also see in human centenarians. And no surprise, since the number one cause of death in these United States is the American diet. Unsafe sex. <laughs> is bad. And we definitely did not expect to find a love story. I'm looking for a date. Oh, you're going to go on a hot date tonight? I'm meeting a date tonight. Wow. He's been looking for you. Um, He's been checking his texts every 30 seconds. That was so good. That was so good. <laughs> but my real fascination was, who are the people who arrive early on a cold, rainy night for a chance to meet him and sit riveted listening to a talk about scientific papers? Well, I was already vegan before, so um, it has made me more thoughtful and think about things more, but it did not change what I ate since I was already vegan. And is it working for them? Howdy, howdy. Are you groupies? Oh, hi. 
Hey! How long have you guys been following, I guess, the Gregor prescribed diet? <laughs> well, I've, uh, since 2012. And what kind of health changes have you noticed since going on the Gregor way? Oh, uh, so I lowered my cholesterol and I lowered uh, my blood pressure. And that was my that was my goal. Uh, same with me. My yeah. went down. All lost, that. Lost weight. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's similar, like a lowering of cholesterol, um, weight also loss. weight, like 20 pounds weight loss. Wow. Um, yeah. And you kept it off? Yeah, kept, kept well, it you off. Just, yeah. You keep doing the same yeah, thing. It's yeah. not like a diet, it's yeah, a lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so how long has it been off? Um, so that has been at least now, I've been six years. Wow. So it's supposed to come roaring back for six months. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, again, no, no, again, no, 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 no. As long as you keep doing yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the same it's thing, it doesn't change. Vegan. It's vegan. It's healthy vegan. Right, right, <laughs> healthy right. plant based. But it's right? it's it's just it's conscious eating is yeah, what it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, it's been the best decision I Absolutely. ever made. Yeah, yeah. And I have other like um, chronic diseases, and it's been I incredible do. for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like what? Uh, type one diabetic. Oh, and no. so I follow oh. the Mastering Diabetes program. Oh yeah. And I um, those guys yeah, they're fantastic. Yeah. I'm actually like in their program, and um, yeah, it, it it you know because I've been that for like 36 years, yeah. and it's such a change. People don't think yeah. along those lines. And I sit down and I have 100 grams of like carbohydrates yeah. uh, for my breakfast with has fruit and oats in it. Yeah. You know, it's incredible. Yeah. yeah. So we're getting a selfie taken or we're getting a photo taken. <laughs> <laughs> People don't think about the impact of veganism when it comes to being diabetic. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's just—it's a game changer. Yeah, it's a total game changer. Are, are you are you using less insulin now? Using less insulin, more insulin sensitive, less insulin resistant. I was always tightly controlled, so let's yeah. be really clear on that. I'm type one, type A personality. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's all about my health in the end, yeah. but um, it just makes you feel better, so yeah. much better in the That's end. Great. And well, the twenty pounds it, must have helped too. Yeah, absolutely. And plus, also, it it defies the way of current thinking out there, right? The yeah. public or your endocrinologists are like "Ooh, how are you eating how am I oh you should limit your carbs and it's like no it's about the right kind of carbs yeah 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 so yeah yeah, yeah that's yeah, great it's been fantastic congratulations yeah you guys. thank you thank you thank you, nice yeah, thank you all you Whoa, have girl. made a huge Huge. impact in my life in many ways i appreciate everything you do oh, i'm thankful oh thank God. you i'm so happy to have what specific ways oh, oh my gosh the app um i use the yeah. app just his books um i've taken the the plant-based nutrition T. Colin Campbell. Oh yeah, yeah. I've, listened, I've oh, taken wow. that course. I've wow. listened to him. All his documentaries. You're hardcore. And, yeah. yeah, his nutrition yeah. orgs. I've listened to his videos. I send them yeah. to my clients. I make him watch them. My husband. Yeah. You guys like <laughs> she brought me here. It's my wife, and um, so I'm here just to learn. A lot of yeah, men are just new. obeying. Yeah. No, but I'm actually excited. She she has me really excited, and yeah, I've watched some of the great. videos, you know, leading up to this, and I feel like I know enough to be dangerous, and so I'm actually that's looking great. forward to it. That's great. Yeah. You now when I tell him to do stuff, he doesn't look at me like, really, Jen, not another thing. I'm gonna say, see, it's it's backed by science. It's not me just being a uh, funny wife. <laughs> so, did you notice some health changes? Absolutely. Like I, I was one of those who was always a little bit, um, I'm into fitness and stuff. So I was always a little bit wary of carbs and, um, you know, but adding in enough whole grains, like my strength has improved. My sleep has improved. I'm going through menopause. Um, I have some lung issues and I read where he said black cumin is really great for, for lungs. You're going through menopause, but you're only 26 years old. <laughs> no, I'm going to be 50. Oh, man. You um, yeah. She does yeah. not look 50. Um, yeah. But anyways, yeah, and that, that's really helped my lungs. The black cumin added in every day that I don't cough so much. Um, so, yeah, lots of little lifestyle things that um, I've learned from him that I've incorporated. And it's, like I said to him, it's made a really big impact. We met a surprising number of medical professionals who attended. Well, I'm an oncologist and an MD, and I work full time for UCSF. In the past, there have been concerns that Dr. Greger looks at plant-based diets with rose-colored glasses and could use some more fact-checking. Dr. Gil Carvalho made an episode with a lot of views, fact-checking a seven-minute debate Dr. Greger was in, and I did think that Dr. Carvalho's concerns were valid. But a short debate is a very different thing from a massive book.
There are a lot of great books about longevity written by scientists who actually run longevity studies for their careers. And yet none of their books are as broad as this one. How is that possible? I think it's because in Dr. Greger's evolution, he's built up a team. I've got 22 people on staff. We just hired two new nutrition PhDs. But my question is, since you're donating all the proceeds from the books and from your talks, how do you make your living? Yeah, totally. <laughs> ah! the, the, the question, wait a second. <laughs> If I'm donating all my all the the book proceeds, right, selling millions of books, uh, if all that money is going to charity, in fact, the same thing with sales of all my DVDs and back, same with all the sales of my VHS. That was, I've been around for a while, all right, and all the honorary speaking honoraria that I get all donated to charity. How? Okay, so I get a salary through NutritionFacts.org, which is a nonprofit 501c3. So if you want to help me put kale on the table, <laughs> you can donate to uh, tax deductible uh, uh, charitable donation to NutritionFacts.org. So basically, we kind of run like the Wikipedia model, where everything's free. Um, no ads, no corporate sponsorship, strictly not commercial, not selling anything, just put up as a public service. But we reach so many millions of people that if one in a thousand people kicks in a few bucks, like, you know, we're totally fine. Um, and so we can get the 22 staff and we can go through the tens of thousands of papers and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So um, that's, that's, how the, that's how the vegan sausage is made. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> I haven't come across credible debunking of how not to die or how not to age, even though the industry has huge incentives to discredit them. Because the foods that represent the lion's share of food industry profit are not on his daily dozen. I don't think the average consumer can imagine the big industry programs to discredit scientists in nutrition and climate science. The beef industry alone has a military-style command center to monitor social media from people like me and Dr. Greger. They have an MBA program, Masters of Beef Advocacy, with 21,000 graduates that they supply with beef talking points who bomb our comments sections and downvote our videos. And as Marion Nessel points out, they fund papers with the express purpose of creating doubt. Michael Greger's team of 22 is dwarfed by these efforts. Fruit and vegetable companies have nothing to compare to this. Dr. Carvalho listed Peter Atia's podcast episodes about blood lipids as especially good. As usual, I agree with Dr. Carvalho about those particular episodes. But Dr. Atia's book is a case study on how hard it is to write a book on a broader topic when you're not a specialist and don't have a large team like Dr. Greger does. I made an episode about that. Unfortunately, you can make it a bestseller as Dr. Atia has by claiming that jerky loaded with salt is a longevity food, for example. Not something career longevity researchers would ever say. I attended a healthy aging conference this week hosted by the Stanford Center for Longevity, and there were a number of scientists concerned about seeing yet another harmful fad diet book top the charts, this time from Dr. Atia. I know something about longevity researchers, so TEDx Boston has asked me to organize a day of longevity talks on International Longevity Day. And we've had to do our best to attract the best in the world, people whose books and papers do stand up to fact-checking. Longevity researchers don't agree on every single thing, like supplements, but I think it's remarkable how closely they agree on some very critical things. In no particular order, whole food, plant-dominant diets, exercise, good friends, sense of purpose, good sleep. Access to health care, financial security, continual learning, letting go of grudges, healthy weight. I ran out of fingers and didn't even get to things like smoking, avoiding pollutants, and taking care of our teeth. Career longevity researchers may rank them differently, and details may vary, but it's remarkable that they agree on all of them. Dr. Greger's book reminds me of this one that I bought from a collector published in 1910, How to Live 100 Years being a synopsis of the most recent discoveries of eminent physicians, bacteriologists, biologists, and chemists like Michnikov, who had just won a Nobel Prize. It has timeless wisdom, such as we are awakening as a people to the fact that it is far better to prevent disease than to cure it, and that disease and early old age can be prevented. And here's a passage that I think helps explain where Dr. Greger's book fits among longevity books to those eminent physicians who made the discoveries all credit is due. But they have been so busy making discoveries that they have done but little to make them known to the general public. 
The newspapers and magazines only publish them in isolated fragments. I often go directly to eminent scientists as I did last month because I believe the ones who are actually doing the research are the ones who know it best. But did I read How Not to Age? Absolutely. I'm not aware of any book that broad except this reference tome 2,000 pages that nobody read. If Dr. Greger says something that doesn't sound right, you can read the references he cites and come up with your own conclusion. And few longevity researchers can talk about a boring subject like salt and make it stick, but you can't miss what Dr. Greger says about it. But the single deadliest ingredient in humanity's diet is something we actually get too much of, and that's salt. Our number one dietary risk factor for death. How do we know it's cause and effect? Five kitchens at a veteran's retirement home were randomized into two groups for a few years, offering meals salted either with regular salt or, unbeknownst to them, a 50-50 blend of regular salt, sodium chloride, with potassium salt like these, uh, potassium chloride, salt substitute. The kind of salt was the only difference between the meals, and cardiovascular disease death rates plummeted in the reduced sodium blend. The new difference in life expectancy between the two groups at age 70 was equivalent to that which would have occurred naturally in 14 years, meaning even just switching to half potassium salt, for which you wouldn't even be able to taste the difference, effectively made them more than a decade younger when it came to the risk of premature death. So that's an example of me wondering whether Dr. Greger was wearing rose-colored glasses, picking a study with such a dramatic effect. So I read this study. It was conducted in Taiwan, which has higher sodium consumption than in the U.S. And the studies I came across in the U.S. seem to have less dramatic results but still very dramatic. And we have a large Asian American population in the U.S. and people like me who love Asian food. So, Dr. Greger took a lot of questions from the audience and I could not get John Oliver out of my mind. So a lot of my friends drink alkaline water. I'm wondering what you think of A lot of your friends are duped. <laughs> We can alkalize our bodies, or actually our urine, with dark green leafy vegetables. So plant foods in general, particularly dark green leafies, the most alkaline forming foods. Urine, you can actually use a little uh, pH strip. You can buy like, you know, a drugstore or something. You pee on the pH strip and you want it to be, and you want it to turn blue as opposed to red. Red is acid, blue is alkaline. And so you can do a cool experiment with the kids where you have them eat a bunch of greens. And then they pee and then it's like, ah, oh, look, it went from red to blue, it went from pink to blue. Woo! <laughs> in a world of food intolerances and allergies for just about every food, red meat, seafood, eggs, wheat, beans, nuts, nightshade, vegetables, I often wonder what Dr. Greger says to people who eat his daily dozen and then run into trouble as you can on any diet. There's still an issue to be addressed, which is food intolerance, lectins and beans, uh, proper preparation, avoidance of nightshades. What do you think about those concerns? Uh, the point is being made that there's certain food intolerances regardless of what you eat. Uh, some people have food allergies, right? So peanuts are good for people unless it, peanuts kill you, in which case they're not good for you. Yeah, I mean, so there are certainly like food allergies and things. So like nightshades, about 120 people who have joint pain, their pain gets better if they avoid nightshades. Like that's awesome. So every patient I used to have, I'm no longer in clinical practice, every single patient with, with joint pain, I said, cut out nightshades and see if it helps. I mean, wouldn't that be amazing if something like that helps? I mean, it's like, that's the, the dream in medicine. There's no downside, right? Okay. Um, now, of course, 19 out of 20, 95% of people didn't work. But look, if you're the lucky person, it works. Awesome, right? Okay, so give it a try, right? Um, but for everybody else, I mean, these are super healthy foods, right? Tomatoes, lycopene, decreases prostate cancer risk. I mean, there's really, I'd hate people to avoid these super healthy foods. But if you're one of those rare individuals, obviously, you should avoid those super healthy foods. That probably explains a lot of the anecdotes that flood my inboxes. I tried the carnivore diet and my skin broke out like I had poison oak. I tried a plant-based diet and got terrible joint pain. Plants are trying to kill us. Dr. Greger wasn't the only speaker. 
Dr. Hummel gave a great opening talk about workshops that help farm workers return to their traditional diet of rice, beans, and vegetables, and how it often drops their fasting glucose, among other things, dramatically. She's an angel. This event even had food. I helped to make some of the um, ingredients that go into the appetizers that we'll be having tonight. If you've never tried Beth Love's cashew cheese, you're in for a real treat. Oh yeah, so, I'm up for it. <laughs> Whoa, look at that. Beet cake on this end, and then flaxseed crackers with cashew cheese. These are delicious. Wow, what have you got I'm there? Sure. Oh, this is a microphone. Hello. What have you got here? I have delicious mushrooms. Oh, oh wow. And yeah. I snuck one to see if what I was handing out yeah. is really good. <laughs> I don't know, Beth had tons of mushrooms, and I guess Santa Cruz has um, far west fungi, so she was able to get some beautiful shiitake mushrooms, cremini mushrooms, and oyster mushrooms. So these are the, they're like little sandwiches, and the, it's almost a cracker with, um, but it's all plant-based and all homemade, and then the little cheese on top. It's a vegan cashew cheese. Are you sure that's not dairy? Oh, I'm positive. I made it. It looks amazing. <laughs> I know it. I know it. That looks good. Let's go it take is. a look. Oh, yeah. Wow. Veggies, lots of veggies, all plants. And down there, it's a carob. Yes. Mint pie. Mint pie. That's mint on there? Mint is the green. Mint is the green. That's yes, a lot of... Right. It's, oh, I see. Wow. That's the little, little beautiful color. There was even a choir. It is time now. It is time now that we cry. And it a long now. late night line for signing books. Dr. Gregor just finished giving his talk and people are waiting to get their books signed. He's a rock star. <laughs> oh my god, he's our hero. I am thrilled. It's actually so fun to see him in person. No, I really, I mean it. I got a nice note from Netta, Dr. Gregor's date that night. They were introduced by Brenda Davis. I know some of you are wondering, but Netta said there will be a second date. <laughs> 